By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are looking at the first top eight match of the Raging Bull series in Amsterdam. And here we have Bjorn taking on Nick. They're both Dutch players and they're both playing with the deck, the famous control uh, deck in old school. And some players even say that the deck has no bad matchups. So it's all about how good the, the player is that you're playing against. So if your skills are good enough, you should win each match. Now, I'm not sure if that's true because I've seen the deck failing um, a lot of times and it's also true that usually you'll find a couple of the deck players in the top eight and, and so is true today as well. And let's quickly, for the ones who are not familiar with the deck setup, let's quickly go uh, through some cards. So the deck uses counter spell, mana drain, red elemental blasts, uh, disenchants, trip mines and sorts of plowsiers to trade on a one for one basis with your opponent's threat. So it has a lot of these one for one trade cards. And then when the deck stabilizes, you use cards like Ancestral Recall, Brain Geyser, uh, Janum Tome, Library of Alexandria, of course, to gain card advantage. And then when you have that card advantage, um, you know, you can start milking it. So you've got your Disrupting Scepter, maybe, or you have, you know, a mode to keep your opponent at bay. And as you s gradually, you're just taking control of the entire match, and then you start building up with your win con. So that could be a Sarah Angel or, you know, another beefy creature, but it could also uh, be using a simple fireball uh, to win the game. We see that often as well. Sometimes even the Brain Geyser is used to deck your opponent. So it's going to be interesting to see, um, you know, how these players play and what their specific um, strategy is with their version of the deck. So that's going to be interesting to look at in this match. Unfortunately, because of a um, an error in the stream, we don't have the first game. So we're gonna start with the second game. Game number two, and it's kind of strange to say here. The first game was won by Nick, he's sitting on the right, and Bjorn is sitting on the left. So I assume uh, Bjorn is then on the play, choosing to start with that control train. And there's a blue mana, not a fox, uh, Mox Sapphire. Ooh, and there's a Library of Alexandria, so. And Bjorn needs to win this one to still have a chance of becoming the first champion of the Raging Bull series. And there's a City of Brass followed by a Mox Ruby. And Bjorn is now able to counter. And there's another island and now Nick also has two islands online. And that's kind of what you're um, looking at when you're playing against a control deck. When two bl blue mana are up, you know it's going to be difficult. Already four mana on the board. And passing turn here. And uh, for Bjorn, it's, it's business to get a strip mine or, you know, get that library out of the way. Or make sure that Nick's hand size goes down. And this is interesting. He's playing a Hercules Recall and there's a Red Elemental Blast. I like this. So that's played main board. And this is interesting. Followed by the destruction of the Soul Ring there. So we're seeing some action. He's taking a damage. And ooh, playing a Dust to Dust. And of course I forgot we're here playing after sideboarding. So both players have put some cards in their sideboard here. Maybe that Red Elemental Blast is main, maybe it was sideboard, but I believe that Dust to Dust is definitely a card that came in from the sideboard. And all of a sudden, um, Nick's hand is, or board is completely clear, but now he plays a Janum Tome because Bjorn was all tapped out. And another nice side effect for Bjorn was in that whole, oh, and there is a mind twist here. So the tables have turned where I first thought that uh, Nick was very much in the advantage with the Library of Alexandria. All of a sudden he has no cards in hand anymore. Of course he does have the Jadum Tome, already has two cards now, so he can draw cards with that. But what I wanted to say is because of all those counter battles, it's always positive. Ooh, and there is a Divine Offering so that Chaos Orb activation doesn't go through. So that's very important here because you want to destroy that book because once again, Bjorn doesn't have card advantage. And when you're playing with the deck, you want to have card advantage. Control and card advantage. You don't want to win necessarily. You can win later in the game. So here's a Brain Geyser. And there's not a counterspell here from Nick. 
So this is really nice here. I mean, Bjorn is doing everything he can do to kind of fight back, fight his way back into this game, fight his way back into the match, because remember, he's already down one game. And what I wanted to say about the counter wars is that um, the big advantage for Bjorn going into that counter war is not even winning it, but the fact that uh, Nick will then no longer have seven cards on hand, thus deactivating his own library of Alexandria. So that's always in the, in, the, in the back of your mind when you're knowing, okay, my opponent's going to counter, but hey, he has a library of Alexandria there. and So that's going to help me. And this is interesting. A recall here, taking back a counter spell and a red elemental blast, and that's not pretty. So you know that if I'm going to play a, a threat that's too big, for instance, destroying the book, he's going to counter it. And it's going to be interesting to see if Nick is going to attack here with his factories. And he does, he animates them, hitting him for four. And it's hard to see the dice there at the bottom, but I believe Bjorn is now down to 11 life. And there's a library of Alexandria of his own. And that's one of the reasons why the card is so strong is he cannot counter it. And of course, uh, Nick has a strip mine there. But this is a smart move from Bjorn waiting for Nick to counter, to tap that strip mine, knowing at least he gets one card out of the library of Alexandria. And there's a demonic tutor. Will there be a counterspell? He knows that Nick has a counterspell in hand. And maybe he's going to use this demonic tutor to look up his strip mine and strip the strip mine of Nick. So maybe Nick is thinking about this. And yes, he's going to counter it. And I wonder if that's the reasoning behind this counterspell. Is there going to be a counter to counterspell? There's going to, there's going to be a mana drain here. And then there's a red elemental blast and another counterspell. Now this is exactly what you expect when you're looking at the deck match is endless countering, countering upon countering, but it is interesting. Um, and he's now looking what's in his graveyard, probably to decide what he wants to pick. I'm curious if he's going to pick that strip mine, because, I mean, his hand size must be very limited now. So he also has deactivated his own uh, library with this little counter war. So, uh, but that was really nice. Some nice magic there from Bjorn, because he knew that uh, Nick, of course, had the counter spell on the Red Elemental Blast. And of course, kind of, you know, Nick's goal now is, you know, he has the two factories, so that's good for him, and he has the book. So he just doesn't want uh, Bjorn just to make any, any further steps. And interesting, he's not playing anything out. And there's, of course, this is a strip on the library. And there's an attack just for two now, because he needs his mana open to counter. So an attack here for two. He goes to eight, I believe. And Bjorn's going to play a moat. And then I keep wondering, is that the card that he looked up or not? And a disenchant. And that's, that's the deck for you. The deck has so many answers. So you think, okay, my opponent is kind of running low in counter spells. So let's start, you know, playing a moat. And then, of course, he has disenchants as well. He has swords. His red elemental blasts. And like I said in the introduction, like many people say, you know, the, the deck is as good as the player. And that may be so, but pl by playing with the deck, you're also putting some, some pressure on yourself in the tournament. Because people kind of expect you to get far when you're playing the deck. And Bjorn is on three life now. And it's not looking good. What can he still do? He's playing a book. But the book alone is not going to save him. So the question is, is Nick going to do something about it or think, hmm, I got this. I just want to make sure my factory can still deal damage. And no, he's not allowing me playing a mana drain here. Oh, I like this. There's a time twister. <laughs> It's, I mean, that's, I like that. I like that when, when you're playing, you're like, you're on three life, he's countering everything, he's, he's disenchanting. It's like he has an answer to everything you do, and, and you still keep going. So this is nice. And when we look at the board, what's very important is that, um, I believe Bjorn, yeah, Bjorn still has four mana open. Do remember that the City of Brasses give him damage, so he's only on three life. So the City of Brasses are not really an option. Um, and again, he's now going to draw seven cards. If it's a disenchant and he wants to disenchant the um, factory upon animation, the problem is now that Nick has a full grip of cards and he has a library of Alexandria. So the chances are here that he can find some kind of counterspell. Um, there's a Mox Pearl. And 
And what can they do? I mean, a Chaos Orb would be, would be really ideal here. Although Nick can counter now, because he has that Felwer Stone, so he has blue mana and he has the City of Brass. I wonder what, what he's going to do. He's tapping his Mox Pearl. Taking a damage here, playing a Demonic Tutor. <laughs> oh. oh, oh, oh. And is he then going to look up a Chaos Orb and try to flip on the Mistress Factory? That would be insane, because that would put him down on one life. But he needs to get rid... Uh, sorry, he needs to get rid of that uh, Mistress Factory. Or maybe just looking up another factory and playing out his own factory. But that it's, it's all very risky. Whatever you do at this point, it's all very risky. I'm not sure if you already played the land. I mean, it, it, this turn has been taken so long, I'm not sure. And this is so interesting. So he's on two life. Nick is still on 19, so clearly he's ahead. He has a, he has a library, he has a handful of spells. There's a time walk, of course. Oh, and there's a red elemental blast, and that means it's game here for Nick. And uh, I didn't even think about the time walk, so... Um, but yeah, I mean, Bjorn knew this is my only out. Just, you know, to get another... At least another turn in and, and see if I can kind of change things around here. They're showing each other the... Uh, the sideboard choices. Uh, thank you for watching this very short and um, interesting game of this uh, mirror matchup between two, the deck players, uh, Bjorn and Nick. And uh, Nick, you're going to the semifinals. I don't know if you're going to play it on stream. We'll see. Or maybe see you back in the, in the finals. For now, thank you for watching this episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And if you'd like to see more old school magic, uh, you can check out the videos that are appearing right now on the screen. You can click on the links to see the games or you can take a look at my channel, Timmy the Sorcerer, and you can also see more uh, matches there from the Raging Bull series in Amsterdam and many other tournaments that have been played in the Netherlands. For now, thank you for watching and see you next time. <laughs>